The following is a presentation from Bethel Baptist Church and Pastor Al Fury. 653, 653, I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. Let's sing it out this morning. page 651 since I have been redeemed 651 are you glad you're saved this morning amen 651 I have
standing. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say, so I'm going to share a passage of scripture with you in 1 Peter 1 and verse 18. It says, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the traditions of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, and was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and your hope might be in God, seeing ye have purified your souls, and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. All flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof fadeth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Amen. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer this morning. Good to have Pastor Powell with us. Would you leave some prayer, please? Heavenly Father, thank you for the chance to be here uh, today. We're so grateful for your grace, for your patience, for your kindness, for your mercy. We're grateful, Lord, that uh, the Bible says that we have fresh mercies every day. We thank you, Lord, for your watch and care over us and ask you, Lord, that you would just help us to serve you, love you, honor you, put you first, help us to serve each other diligently, and help us, Lord, this morning to celebrate all that we have in Jesus Christ because of what he has done for us in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Yeah. Father, you are everything. And without you, we have nothing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat>
number 650, Redeemed How I Love to Proclaim It. 650, let's stand as we sing this morning about God's great redemption. glad that you're here this morning while we'll our ushers come for this morning's offering let me give you a couple of prayer requests and a couple of praises today first of all let's pray for brother dorks and brother dorks in the hospital got an infection and uh, wasn't very good for a couple days uh, doesn't even actually remember when he went in the hospital but i believe he went in thursday night we heard about it friday went up to the hospital visited with him uh, and he said i wouldn't have known you a few hours ago but he says i'm starting to do better uh, and then Barb stopped in the church this morning, his daughter, and said he's doing much better as of last night. And so continue to pray for Brother Dorkson. He hopes to go home early next week. Um, but these things, of course, take a little bit more time than we would always hope for. So let's remember that. Remember Owen Sullivan, uh, Bob and Donna's grandson. I guess he had surgery again last night, I heard. And he's been, he had his tonsils out a week ago Thursday. Is that, is that correct? A week ago Thursday. He's had some bleeding issues post-operative, and uh, they've had to cauterize and cauterize and cauterize. So they finally decided to do surgery last night. How's he doing now? He was up all night? Oh, he slept all night. Good. All right. So a lot, yeah, he's very uncomfortable, lots of pain. So let's continue to pray for Owen. And then we have some good news. Brother Judge, can you put that picture up on the screen for us? Congratulations, Kevin and Kristen. And uh, this is their little one, and uh, we'll have one of the grandparents. Where are the woods here? Jim and Joanne? Oh, congratulations, and Mrs. Bowsfield, congratulations. Why don't you go ahead and give us the name and the weight and everything, Jim? Tobias, Kevin, Everett Wood, 8 pounds, 3 ounces. And Kevin told me that Tobias means a gift from God. And so he says, we chose that name as soon as we knew we were having a boy. So praise the Lord. That's a great attitude. And so we're excited for them. And so I'm guessing they'll probably come home maybe today or tomorrow. 
We had the baby last night, so tomorrow. Okay, so the baby just born yesterday, and that picture's just a few hours old. And so congratulations to everybody there, all the family. Lots of aunts and uncles around here, that's for sure. And so we're excited for uh, this little guy. He'll get spoiled, all right? Let's go, Lord, in prayer and ask his blessing on our services today. And uh, we're thankful to God for all that he's done, and we just praise him today. Uh, Brother Spong, would you lead us in prayer this morning, please? Now let's take our hymn books again. In just a moment, Mrs. Judge is going to sing a song called Fear Not Tomorrow, for God's already there. But it's because he lives I can face tomorrow. So we're going to sing about that same theme, that great theme of the Bible. Let's stand 142. 142, because he lives, I can face tomorrow.
and good singing. You may be seated. Fear not tomorrow. God is already there. The kids dismiss as we sing out this last hymn. Were you going to do that? Yeah. Okay, you can do that then. <laughs> <laughs> for once, it wasn't my fault. <laughs> uh, if you remember to pray for uh, our little baby, uh, he's going to have some identity crises because we've been calling him Toby this whole time. Uh, so we'll have to find a new name for our, our uh, little boy when he comes. But we're, we're happy for Kevin and Kristen for sure, even if they stole our name. But, uh, so we'll pray for our junior church kids and we'll be dismissed. Lord, we thank you so much. Uh, God, for these blessings that you've given to us, we thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you together. Uh, I pray that you'd be with us in Jiren Church. Bless the children as well as the workers. We pray in your name. Amen. Let's sing that song together. Two, two, two. I know who holds tomorrow. Children, you can be dismissed. We'll stand as we sing this together. I know who holds tomorrow.
be seated. Take your Bibles this morning, please. Turn to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. My apologies to Pastor Gooding. He did not take his wife's name when they got married, so he's not Pastor Powell. He's Pastor Gooding. Uh, my apologies, brother, and I appreciate that. He sends me a devotion every Saturday morning I get by email, and I appreciate those so much. I'm a little intimidated today. i got three pastors here that i got to pass the scrutiny of, and so... Uh, one is taught in a, a couple of taught in Bible colleges and stuff too, so it's a little bit intimidating. We're good to have Brother Teeson here. The Teesons will be sharing their ministry this evening a little bit and preaching a little bit more, and so we're looking forward to their ministry to us. And many of you remember the Teesons from being on staff. That's been a while now. Um, you pastored in Mississauga for 20 years, and I remember in Hamilton, we had a missions conference on a Saturday night. Brother Teeson presented his work, and on Sunday morning started the church. And so we were with you right at the start there and enjoyed watching that church grow. And God has blessed the Mississauga International Baptist Church over the years and, and such a blessing. And now God has changed uh, their direction a little bit. And you'll hear more about that tonight. So you'll want to be here and support them and be a blessing to them. We already took them on for support and we're excited to be able to do that. But he's going to have to come and preach for his supper. So we're going to have him do that tonight. Luke chapter 9. Let me say this. Brother Dorkson loves, loves, loves visitors. He just, you know, he's, he's sitting around all the time. He says, I've never got to watch so much hockey and baseball in my life. And he says, I've got to admit, I'm sick of it. I never thought I'd heard Brother Dorkson say he was sick of watching sports, but he's, he's just bored. And so he'd love to have you visit. And if you get a chance to get up to the hospital in the next day or two or pass by his home, he would appreciate that so much. And I know that goes for so many of our senior folks that are shut in and, and uh, don't get out very much. Missing church, missing fellowship. And so make sure you try to encourage them. Luke chapter 9, we're going to continue this morning with our Miracles of Jesus series. The Miracles of Jesus Christ. And we've been looking through the book of Luke. And this morning we're in Luke chapter 9 and verse 37. The deliverance of the demoniac boy. The deliverance of the demoniac boy. I'm going to preach a little differently this morning than I normally would. I'm going to give you the points first. I'm going to go through the scripture and give you the points. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the power the power of God. But we, as we have learned so much, as we've been looking at these miracles, the miracles of themselves, uh, how, many, how many of you understand by the time we get to Luke chapter 9, verse 37, Jesus doesn't have anything left to prove. He already showed He is the Son of God. He's already cast out demons several times to this point. As a matter of fact, if you'll read between the lines, you will see in several scriptures in that he would come into a land and it says he'd heal them of diverse diseases and cast out unclean spirits. And so there's hundreds and thousands of miracles that have taken place that aren't even recorded in full. As a matter of fact, this miracle around the demoniac boy is essentially one verse. You will see that as we read through the passage, there's just one verse, Jesus casts out the demons and moves on. But there's an, a bigger lesson for us to learn that we've been seeing as we've gone through this study. There's something else about God wants us to know and to understand. And so this morning is no different. So we're going we're gonna to give you the points, then we're going to give you the power, and then we're going to talk about some principles that we draw from this passage of Scripture. And I hope and I pray it will be a help to you this morning as God caught my attention with something just this week that I think will help us. Luke chapter 9, look at verse 37. The Bible says, And it came to pass that on the next day, when they were come down from the hill, much people met him. You might want to underline in your Bible, much people met him. And let me challenge you to do this. As you read through the Gospels, underline every time you see much people, multitudes, the press, and you will find out that if it were not for the Spirit of God strengthening him, Jesus would have been absolutely exhausted from all the people that thronged him every single day of his life. There's no rest in between. The Bible says this is the next day, referring to a previous time of teaching and miracle working. And it's the very next day that they were come down from the hill that much people met him. And behold, a man of the company cried out saying, Master! I beseech thee, look upon my son, for he is mine only child. And lo, a spirit taketh him, and he suddenly crieth out. And it teareth him that he foameth again, and bruising him, hardly departeth from him. And I besought thy disciples to cast him out, and they could not. And Jesus answering said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring thy son hither. And as he was yet a coming, the devil threw him down and 
tear him. By the way, any time you try to get somebody to Jesus, the devil will stop it. Or he'll try to stop it. The Bible says the devil interrupted this important employment and tore the man again, this boy, and threw him on the ground. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and delivered him again to his father. That's the miracle. One verse. Verse 42. Let's read it again. And as he was yet a coming, the devil threw him down and tear him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and delivered him again to his father. Boy, in the power of God, something. For Jesus, it was just like walking through the supermarket. It might say, and he chose an apple and put it in his shopping cart. It's just that passe or that simple for Jesus Christ. The Bible says he rebuked the unclean spirit and he departed from him. And that was the end of the miracle. What wonderful power that our God possesses. And read on in verse 43. And the Bible says, And they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. But while they wondered, every one at all things which Jesus did, he said unto his disciples, let's pray. Father, we are grateful and thankful for your power today. And so, Father, we pray once again as we've looked at many miracles now, that you would impress upon our hearts not just the power of God, which is so important, that we would know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, that you are the sent one, the Messiah, that you have the power of God on high, and Lord, that you are able to meet our every need and take care of our every problem and circumstance. But more than that, help us to draw the lesson you'd have for us today. And Father, we'll thank you and praise you. God, I need your help. And so to the best of my ability, I surrender to thee, and I ask, Lord, that you would fill me and use me, and may the Spirit of God speak to each heart that would listen today. And Father, we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. This gentleman that we read about in verse 38, it says, a man of the company. He's nondescript. Nothing here says that he stands out from anybody else. There's nothing here that says that Jesus had an appointment with him. That would not be unusual, though. Jesus said, I must needs go through Samaria. And there was a time that he designed to meet with the woman at the well. There was times that he had appointments and was in just the right place. It seems to meet with Zacchaeus and to meet with others and to be right on time that God could meet their appropriate needs. But in this case, he was just another man of the company. He was one that had come to Jesus like so many thousands before and was pressing upon him for some attention. We see that he had a great need and The need was in the form of his child, and perhaps he would not be so abrupt, but the need was not for himself. It was for his son. I think you would agree with me that we would often tend more to our children's suffering than to our own. We'll put their needs before ours. We'll make sure that they have clothes on their back and that they have their food on their plate before we would ever fill ours or clothe ourselves. And so this man had a very desperate situation, and as we look at the points this morning, let me give them to you quickly. We'll go verse by verse, and we notice, first of all, in verse 38, the desperation of the situation. We notice the desperation of the situation. The man says this, he cried out saying, Master, I beseech thee, or I beg thee, I plead with thee, look upon my son, for he is mine only child. The Bible does not mention anything about his mother. I would think that if his mother were alive and well enough to attend this meeting, she would also be there pleading for her son. For it was in the region that her son dwelt. And Jesus was passing by and it was no secret that he was coming out of the hill and a crowd arose and perhaps this man thought he's going to pass right by where my son is. But his mother wasn't there. It leads me to believe that the mother had left or died. And this man was all alone if he lost his son. Perhaps it was his means of support. Perhaps as he aged, he thought, what will I do without a son to take care of the business, to take care of my needs, to help me? And that's how people behaved in those days. They took care of one another. But you'll notice the man didn't cry out for his own needs. I think we would agree that this man probably had some burdens of his own. 
This man probably had some of his own needs. You as parents would understand what sacrifice means and what it means to put the needs of somebody else first. If you're married, you put the other one before yourself. And and so we understand what sacrifice is. And I have no doubt in my heart that it's likely this man had something going on in his life that he could ask Jesus for. Maybe a chronic ailment, maybe a bad hip or a sore knee. or He lived long enough that there must have been something that he could have asked Jesus for, but instead he put his son first. It was a desperate situation. He was his only son, which he chose to emphasize before the Lord so that the Lord would know how he felt, for Jesus was an only son, only begotten of the Father, and he too would be lost if for but only three days as he was forsaken on the cross of Calvary. It was a desperate situation. We see, secondly, we see the destruction of the spirits. In verse 39, it talks about what the spirits were doing to this boy. It says, And lo, a spirit taketh him, and he suddenly crieth out, and it teareth him that he foameth again, and bruising him hardly departeth from him. I believe in the inspiration of the Bible. I believe that the Holy Spirit of God superintended the authors to record exactly what was happening. I believe that if David sinned, it told about that sin. I believe that if somebody lies, it told about those lies. I believe that even if this man right here was mistaken, it's recording accurately what he said. I don't know if the man understood what possession of a spirit meant, but it seems to me that this man was implying that the boy was not necessarily possessed, but a spirit came and took advantage of him from time to time. There are some key things that we see in the Scripture that make me think that way. The Bible says, Lo, a spirit taketh him, and he suddenly crieth out it. It seems like it just happened from time to time, and it teareth him that he foameth. Look at the word, again. It wasn't constant, but it was becoming more and more constant. As the Bible says, And bruising him hardly departeth from him. Now, whether or not the man did not understand in this spirit, this evil demon of hell only occasionally afflicted the boy or only occasionally affected the boy. We really don't know, but he was in a sorry state. Nonetheless, being afflicted by this spirit had, the Bible uses words like bruiseth him and teareth him, foameth at the mouth. It was the destruction. Listen, you know, we we have things today that are far more subtle than what we see in the Bible. I told you, I think just a week ago, about my friend Jim Arnold in Africa who said that, that in Africa, it's out and it's open and there's voodoo in West Africa. That's the home of voodoo. It came over to Haiti on slave ships, or Haiti on slave ships and, and into uh, different places because of that. But uh, it started right there in West Africa and they sacrifice animals and all kinds of chants and dancing and things that they do. And, and I said, boy, you must have really been exposed to that as a child growing up in West Africa. And he says, no, no. He says, it's far worse here in North America. Because the devil is subtle here. He says, there it's open. You can see it and stay away from it. And you can tell your kids and they'll say, oh, it's just so obvious. It's, it's wicked and sinful. And they, they know to avoid it. But in North America, it's disguised. Disguised in our music. It's disguised in our gaming. It's disguised in our behavior. When I was a kid, the, uh, the, the Ouija board and all those kinds of things were big deals. They were fun and harmless games. You see what a spirit can do to you. It can bruise and tear and foaming at the mouth. I don't think Satan would be that obvious in North America because it would be obvious. But he still seeks to destroy your soul. The Bible still says the, roar, the devil's like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Not a cat that purrs. It's a lion that tears. We must be aware of the destruction of the spirits. And then we see in verse 40, the deficiencies of the saints. I've just given you the points quickly, and we'll get to our principles, the preaching this morning. But look at the deficiencies of the saints in verse 40. The Bible says, And I besought thy disciples to cast them out, and they could not. Boy, I can picture that. I, I, I don't know. It, it's a bit... Almost comical to me, but I I hope it's not. 
I see the man coming to the disciples and beseeching them and pleading with them, and there comes Jesus. And he says, all right, if you can't help me, and he runs over to Jesus, and I can see the disciples talking with one another and watching this man talk to Jesus and thinking, oh boy, are we ever in trouble. You can hear the man say, I I asked thy disciples, but... And Jesus looking over at them. He's saying, oh, faithless and perverse generation. I must have ripped their hearts out. The deficiencies of the disciples... For some reason, they thought they could do it on their own, and we'll talk more about that in a minute when we get to our points or our principles. But you know, we are weak and frail. And if anything this miracle teaches us is that even though we may have the Spirit of God, that we are indwelt by God's Holy Spirit, and we are sealed on the day of redemption, that we are children of God, we still need the power of God daily. And we need to beseech God daily for his filling and and surrender to him daily that he might be able to use us as clean vessels. We need the power of God. Then we see in verse 41, the disappointment of the Savior. The verses I'll give you very quickly again. Verse 38, the desperation of the saints. Verse 39, the destruction of the Spirit. Verse 40, the deficiencies of the saints. Verse 41 is the disappointment of the Savior. Verse 41 says, And Jesus answering said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring thy son hither. One of my favorite verses in the Bible comes in the book of Job. And it's not the verse you're thinking of, my Redeemer, you know, all that. But it's this verse. Hast thou considered my servant Job? Oh boy, what a, what a privilege Job had. God opened up the heavens and put a spotlight on him. Job probably wished he didn't after what came next. But for God in heaven to recognize the faithfulness of his servant and to look down and say to Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job an upright man who escheweth evil? He's a good guy. Boy, what a wonderful thing. But in this case, he turns to his disciples. He says, Thou faithless and perverse generation. You have an opportunity to be in one of those two boats. You can hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant one day. Or your reward could be burnt up like wood, hay, and stubble. You have a choice. The things that you are doing for Christ today have eternal value, and God wants to bless you and reward you, but you must choose. And in this case, the Savior was disappointed. Verse 42, we see the deliverance of the Savior. In just one quick verse, it says, And as he was yet a coming, the devil threw him down and tear him, and Jesus rebuked the unclean spirits, and healed the child and delivered him again to his father. We're going to look, when we get to the principles, at the deficiencies of the saints and the deliverance of the Savior. So hold on. We'll expound upon those a little bit more in just a minute. I want to give you the points, the outline of this passage. The deliverance of the Savior. Then we see the delight of the spectators. Verse 43. And they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. So the points are simply this. If you outline in your Bible at all, verse 38, the desperation of the situation. Verse 39, the destruction of the spirits. Verse 40, the deficiencies of the saints. Verse 41, the disappointment of the Savior. Verse 42, the deliverance of the Savior. And verse 43, the delight of the spectator. That's the points. Let's take a minute and talk about the power. I want you to notice two things about the power of God that we notice today. First of all, he had a commanding word. He had a commanding word. The Bible says he just simply rebuked. There's no fanfare to this miracle whatsoever. We're not even aware that all the multitudes saw it, but the Bible says those that did were amazed at the mighty power of God, but Jesus just simply rebuked this unclean spirit and healed the child. Which brings the question, if it was so simple, why couldn't the disciples do it? If God could tap in, or if Jesus could tap into the power of his Father, why couldn't the disciples do it? Turn, if you will, to another account of this in Matthew, or sorry, Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. I want to show you something in the scripture here this morning that I believe could help you. Not because I'm saying it, but because it's from God's holy word. Mark chapter 9. He had a commanding word. Just the power in the word of God. 
Some of the verses that stand out to me in the Bible when I think about the power of God's Word, I, I love it when the soldiers come in the garden to take Jesus, and He says, Who seekest thou? And they all fell down. Well, I like that. That's God's Word. Somebody said about the Word of God, we, we're, we seem to have to defend the Bible today. Somebody said this, Here's how I defend the Word of God. I defend it like it's a lion. I just open it up and let it out. That's probably the wisest way. Let the Word of God speak for itself. But look, if you will, in Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, we see a parallel passage. And the Bible says in verse 29 of our passage, or, 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 sorry, verse 27, by, Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. So Jesus rebuked the Spirit and, and sent it out of the man. And the Bible says here in Mark that Mark records that he took him by the hand and lifted him up. You'll remember he was thrown to the ground. Verse 28. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately. So Mark is part of this private audience afterwards. Why could we not cast him out? And he said unto them, verse 29, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. I would say to you this morning that Jesus had a commanding word, but he also had a consistent walk. Let me ask you this. Turn back to Luke chapter 9. We've read the entire account of this miracle, the demoniac boy. We've read the miracle in verse 42, how Jesus rebuked the spirit and he came out of him. Let me ask you, where did Jesus stop to pray and fast? It's not there, is it? In the book of Matthew, it also says the same thing, that this, forth come, this, this kind cometh not forth but by prayer and fasting. But in Matthew and Mark, neither chapter did Jesus take some time and pray and fast. He did not go off alone and say, well, let me, let me have a few minutes. Oh, the disciples couldn't do it? Well, maybe I better take some time to pray and fast. Give me a couple days and I'll fast and I'll pray. and We'll come back and we'll meet you and we'll take care of this problem. Never happened. That tells me that Jesus had a consistent walk. In other words, he was always filled with the Spirit of God. And he was consistently fasting. And he was consistently in a state of prayer. And he was always ready to work. God's power was on him. And here's a good lesson for us today, friends. You know, sometimes we wait till the problem arises and then we say, well, we better maybe get down to fast and pray. I just read on... Twitter last night, a pastor on Thursday it was Thanksgiving in the United States, and he called a special prayer meeting. It wasn't planned. He says, we're, we're asking everybody to come to the church and meet. He says, uh, a man in the church, he named him, is in his final hours, and we'd like to pray. I'm not against that. Wonderful. Pray for these saints of God that are struggling. But I thought, man, we ought to be prayed up before that. Why aren't, why aren't we having these special prayer meetings Six months ago when he first got sick. Are we having a consistent walk that when the trials and the storms and the diseases and the, 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 the troubles of life, the problems that we face when they come, we, we tend to, and don't get me wrong, I believe God allows trials to draw us closer to him. There's no doubt in my mind. But do you weather the storm because you're consistently prayed up and fasted and ready for what's coming next? Let me ask you this. This summer there was an unusual high rate of hurricanes in the south. And if you were tracking that and following that on the news or whatever, you would see people in Texas and Florida and the Gulf states there. They were, I mean, they would hear they're, they're, this is going to hit landfall by Thursday and by Sunday it'll be further north and by Monday you'll have hurricane force winds and on Tuesday you're going to have the surge of the sea come in and People were putting sandbags and they were boarding up their windows. And he said, what are you saying, preacher? They were prepared. They were ready to the best of their ability. And friends, I know you're not prophets and you can't foretell everything that's going to happen in your life. But this I do know, you can be fasted and prayed up and ready if you'll just go to God. Jesus said to the disciples, the reason you couldn't cast this demon out is because you don't have a consistent walk. You're not fasted and prayed up. This is the only way it's going to work, fellas. They learned an important lesson. We see the points and we see the power of God. Let me give you some principles today. I want you to look back at the deficiencies of the saints that we find in verse 40. 
And I besought thy disciples to cast him out. And they could not. Can I tell you a secret? That was no secret with God. He already knew their limitations. As a matter of fact, fasting is to be a private thing. That's what Jesus taught. Prayer was often when Jesus taught the disciples how to pray. He says, go into thy closet. Don't pray like the hypocrites on the street corners. It's a private thing. It's a conversation between you and God. And fasting is a private thing. But Jesus was privy to it because later on he said, you haven't fasted and prayed enough. He was aware of their spiritual walk. He knew their deficiencies. And so when the man said and pointed out to them, your disciples were unable, Jesus already knew. Now there's no excuse for our deficiencies. But God knows. Psalm 39 says, Lord, David is writing, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days what it is that I may know how frail I am. He's saying, God, you know how frail I am. Could you please remind me? Could you remind me how how, how much I struggle because sometimes I think too much of myself. I think I'm able to handle these problems on my own. And Psalm 103, it says, For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. We are just frail. And that leads us to the second principle, we need the deliverance of the Savior. Years ago, I was working with Brother Rust in the teen department here. And Brother Rust was about to leave. It was 1992. Dr. Strachan was retiring. Brother Rust was leaving. And I was going to be helping the teens until the end of summer, until Pastor Schuler came and, and all the rest. And, and so we were doing a teen bulletin. And so one of the things Brother Russ said, I want you to do the teen bulletin. So in May, I started doing a teen bulletin. And he said, we have a theme verse every month that goes right on the cover of it. And then he said, what's this theme? It was Philippians 4. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Well, printers back then weren't like they are today. It was cut and paste, put on the photocopier, make sure the tape doesn't show. And you guys remember some of those days. And uh, we were doing that. We were using glue sticks and pasting it all together. And when I photocopied it, it cut off the last two words. It says, I can do all things. Didn't say through Christ. Brother Russ, I didn't notice it. Brother Russ didn't notice it. We got up on Sunday and he said, well, let's do our verse today with the teens. And here, I can do all things. Brother Russ, for the next 20 minutes, wisely changed his text and preached on that. He said, that's exactly what we think, isn't it, guys? We can do all things, but we can do nothing without Christ. There's no power outside of Jesus Christ. We need to be reminded that because we are frail and because we are dust, and sometimes we get big on ourselves and think that we can do all things, and the disciples, you say, how do you know? I'll show you in a moment. They thought they could do it, but they desperately needed Jesus. Look what the Bible says as we see the deliverance of the Savior in verse 41. There's a key word here. And Jesus answering said, O faithless and perverse generation. He said the key word must be faithless. No, it's perverse. Truly they lacked faith, but it's because of the perverse they lacked faith. And let me show you what it means. The word perverse literally means here to corrupt, to turn aside, to distort, to oppose or turn against the saving plans of of God. I said, what are you trying to say? God always had a plan to save that little boy. Jesus knew that he'd have a meeting with him there at the bottom of that hill, and he knew that he would cast out that demon, and the disciples would take their turn at it first. But the Bible says, because they were perverse, or because they were not, they turned against the saving plans of God. In other words, we can do this without God. We can do it in our own strength. He said, are you sure that's what it means? Jesus said, this forth cometh not, but without prayer and fasting. You haven't prayed up, guys. You haven't fasted. You you thought you could do this on your own? That's perverse. That's taking what God has made to be good and holy and right and twisting it into something terrible and putrid. (coughs) By the way, that day, the disciples, (coughs) excuse me, damaged their testimony and they brought reproach on the name of Jesus Christ. Just simply because they hadn't prayed up, they didn't have a consistent walk, they hadn't been fasting. They weren't prepared. They weren't prepared. I try to the best of my ability if somebody says, 
hey, could, could, could we come by and have a meeting with you this week? And I say, sure thing. You got to do this, so you got to tell me, give me a little bit of context what it's about. Well, why? We'd rather just talk to you when we get there. I said, that's fine, but here's what's going to happen. I said, you're going to ask me a question. They're going to say, what do you think? And I'll say, I don't know. I haven't prayed about it. You, you, you wouldn't tell me on the phone what it was about. If you told me then, I could have prayed about it a little bit. And then maybe God would have had an answer ready for you. The Bible says that we are to pray without ceasing. The Bible says we're to be careful for nothing but by prayer and fasting. We need to be prepared for the battles of life. Have a consistent walk. And we see that the only way we're going to do that is we have to cling to Jesus. The disciples perverted the plan of God and they tried to do it in their own strength. I believe the disciples' problem here is that they thought they were something. The fact that they were perverse made them both faithless, made them faithless for they were not trusting Christ. They had twisted God's power. You say, did they learn the lesson? Look at Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, we read about the Lord Jesus Christ sending out 70 of his disciples two by two. Told them to go and to not take a script nor a purse. Don't take an extra staff. Trust people to take care of your needs. Stay in a house if you're able. If the town won't receive you, shake the dust off your sandals. The Bible says they returned to the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 17. They had healed the sick. They had done all kinds of things. Preached, people were saved. But here's what they commented on in verse 17. And the 70 returned again with joy saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us. Look at the next three words. Through thy name. They learned. They could have come back and said, oh, Jesus, you wouldn't believe how many people accepted Christ as their Savior. You wouldn't believe how many people got saved on this. You wouldn't believe all the sick people we healed. But they wanted Jesus to know something in particular. Even the demons are subject unto us, but not because of us. It's through thy name. It's the power of God that comes in the name of Jesus Christ. Let me give you some application this morning and we're done. Because we are frail as dust, the Bible says also we are like the grass that withereth. There are some things that we must completely trust the Lord with. I've, I've got three things that we must completely trust the Lord with. And here's the thing. I believe everything in this world will fit into one of these three categories. Number one, we have to learn to trust Christ with our problems. Isn't that what this disciples failed at? The Bible says that, that word perverse is so important. Because it's saying you, you weren't doing it the way of God. You were doing it your own way. You were twisting the methods of God and the ways of God and the works of God and you were going in your own strength and you're, you've perverted this situation and because of it, you're faithless. You're, you're not putting your trust in the right thing. And he says, what you should have done is brought me your problems. But instead, they were ashamed. The father went to the disciples first and Christ second with this problem. Well, we need to learn to go to Christ first. How come we exhaust all the other possibilities, then we turn to Jesus? That's perverse thinking. That's faithless thinking. Faithful thinking says, I will fall on my knees and I will take it to Jesus first. And then I will bear one another's burdens and share it with another. Their perverse attitudes made them think they could solve the problem. Here's number two. Three things we trust God with. First, our problems. Second, people. People. It was interesting. We were studying, I was studying this passage this week, and Brother Baker popped in my office one day, I don't remember what it was, and we were talking about our Master Club's boys, and a couple boys in particular we were really struggling with. And I said, Brother Baker, I said, I said, the only Lord, I was just came out of my office when you got here, knocked on my door, and I was studying this passage, and I said, the Lord spoke to my heart about that, and here's what he said. Nobody could handle that little boy but Jesus. That demoniac child, nobody could handle him but Jesus. And I said, we're trying to, we're trying to discipline these kids, and we're trying to, well, you sit in your seat, and we got a little candy. And we, boy, I tell you what, 
We sugar those kids up before we send them home at 9.30 at night, I'll tell you. We bribe them. We threaten them. We do whatever we can to try to get them to sit and not to be a distraction. We got to get to the point where we say, hey, nobody can handle that kid but Jesus. And so Wednesday, Thursday night, he popped in after work. And he said, let's pray for our boys tonight. We prayed for our boys. And he texted me later night. He said, praise the Lord. He says, you wouldn't believe that one little boy we prayed for. He did his verse. He sat there. He did his work. I said, we had the other one on the bus. He didn't have any, we didn't have any problem with him at all. Hey, you may not be able to handle people problems, but God can. And maybe if we'd spend more time praying for one another than gossiping about one another, fighting with one another, take it to the Lord in prayer. Give that person to God. We often, often deal with people problems. We want to see change. We try to influence. Give it to God. Give it to God. We see in this passage we need to give God the problems, the people. Here's the third one. Principalities and powers. This wasn't just a problem. It wasn't just a people problem. It was a problem with demons. It was a problem in the spiritual realm. Do those three categories pretty much cover everything? Where do your problems lie? They either lie with people. Problems covers everything else. And then the Bible says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual darkness. That's where, our, and for that we put on the armor of God. There's a real battle waging. But that armor is not your armor, it is the armor of God. It's God's protection. It's a shield of faith. It is a helmet of salvation. That is not yours. That is granted by the grace of God through faith. It is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It is what God has equipped you with to be successful in every battle. And so we battle against principalities and powers. You say, what is the remedy for all three? It's in Mark chapter 9, verse 29. It's prayer and fasting. Putting on the armor of God. Being ready for every battle. I'm here to tell you, you may not know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. What a great theme we had to our service this morning. We opened up, we sang about four songs about being redeemed through Christ. But hey, do you know that because you're redeemed, that means you're his purchased possession. You say, what do you mean purchased? He bought you with his blood. He loved you that much that he died on a cross and shed his blood for your sins. Do you know what that tells me? You're precious to him. You are special to him. And he wants what's best for you. And you can trust him with your problems and with, with other people and with the spiritual things that go on in this life. The, the principal, You can trust God. He holds tomorrow in his hand. But we must be prepared. And how do we prepare? Trust God today for tomorrow's problems. Trust God today for tomorrow's problems. I recently heard this, this uh, little cliche, I guess you would call it, that says, I'm just borrowing trouble. You heard that before, I'm sure, borrowing trouble. I'm worried about something that's going on tomorrow that hasn't even, it might be fine. I don't, I don't know if it's going to go sideways or not, but I'm going to worry and fret about it today. Why? Why not pray about it today? Why not fast over it today? Why not trust God with it today? And see if God doesn't have it under control. He's got this. He can take care of your smallest need. Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you for the word. Thank you for the miracles of Christ and the power of God. But Lord, on an application level, help us to learn how to trust you. Lord, to give you all of our problems. And Lord, a lot of our problems are with people. Nobody can handle that little boy but Jesus. Not the disciples, not anybody else. Some of us are struggling with our buses and our master clubs and our children and our grandchildren. Relationships with other adults. Lord, you can take care of that. But we must learn to trust you. Father, help us, Lord, to fight that spiritual warfare too. Lord, all of the 
armor that God gives us is all defensive, protective. The only offensive weapon is the Word of God. Help us to be rooted and grounded in the truth. Help us to stand upon your holy word. Father, speak to our hearts, we pray. During this invitation time, Lord, may we identify some needs in our life that we just need to turn over to you completely and trust you with. Well, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Piano's playing. God has spoke to your heart. Step out and come. Maybe there's one here today that will say, Pastor, I'm not sure I know Jesus as my Savior. <laughs> I know it wasn't necessarily a salvation message, but you heard about a God who loves you. We mentioned how Jesus died on the cross to purchase you. That means he paid the price for your sins. He took your debt upon himself. The Bible is very clear that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. But, because Jesus Christ already paid that price, He died on the cross and he took your penalty. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Say, how do I receive that gift just like you receive any other gift? By faith you receive it. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, there's only one way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man come to the Father but by me. You must come through Jesus Christ because he finished the work at Calvary. There's one here say, Pastor, I'm not sure. If I, were to, if I were to die right now, I don't know where I'd spend eternity. I, heaven or hell, I just don't know. Would you pray for me? I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. Young ladies, it's a very serious time. Please. I won't embarrass you, I promise. But could I pray for you? Is there one? Maybe there's others here today that just need to give a burden to the Lord. You're trying to fix it yourself for so long. Just trust Him today. Brother Baker's going to sing a hymn of invitation. Oh soul, are you weary and troubled? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. You step out and come right on that first verse. <laughs> Amen. God bless you. Look up here just for a moment. We'll be dismissed. Uh, Pray for Pastor and Mrs. McPherson. They're in Oakville today preaching at Cornerstone Baptist Church. I believe the Howards have gone down uh, for American Thanksgiving to see some family. Uh, And so be in prayer for them. They'll be back with us tonight. They only have a morning service there. And so looking forward to pray for them as they minister. And I believe having a little bit of lunch with them. And then they have another, I think, service right away after lunch. And so they, they do that kind of service. So I know that they would appreciate that so much as they travel and minister today. So let's have a word of prayer. I'm looking forward to tonight with the Thiessen family. Come on back, and uh, we'll have a great time in the house of God. All right, let's pray. Our Father, we are thankful and grateful that we can be called the sons of God. What a wonderful blessing it is to be a part of your family because of the salvation you have given us. Father, bless us this afternoon as we rest and fellowship and share in some food. We pray, Lord, that you bless that time. And bless us as we come back this evening. Help the Teesons tonight, Lord, as they present their ministry. Fill them with thy spirit as he preaches. Father, we're looking for a great night in the house of God. May you be honored, glorified, and praised in our lives today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.